Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Hospitality MD podcast. Today, I am joined by David Manilo and our co-host, Greg. Um, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good um, evening. So, <laughs> Depending on what time you're listening to this. Depending on what time you're listening to this. Um, guys, we've got a really exciting podcast today. Um, we're joined by legendary uh, Chicago producer, David Manilo, who's known for his TV show, Check, Please, um, which is a show I'm, I'm sorry to say, David, I'm, I was a little young for Check, Please. I didn't see it uh, when it came out, but um, I have seen the reruns since then. Um, and I know Greg's a, a fan of the show. So Yeah, yeah I was definitely old enough to, <laughs> to watch him live <laughs> on the air. So, <laughs> um, so usually our, our conversations, as you guys know, on these podcasts are um, pretty conversational, but this time I kind of put together some questions for um, David. So we'll kind of roll through those and um, ask, uh, make it as conversational as we can from there. Um, but, but Greg, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm doing great. You know, feeling, uh, <laughs> feeling wonderful. But we're, we're in the middle of a little break from our live show. So it's nice to get back in and, and do a little recording right now. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, um, David had a production company prior to Check Please. Um, David, what was what was that company, and and how did that get started, and how did you meet Joel Cohen, and and all of that in your history? Let us know, kind of your background. Uh, my TV background is yeah. I graduated college. I uh, worked um, for a very early on. 24 hour sports cable operation called Sports Vision, which was owned by the Chicago White Sox, Bulls, Blackhawks, and at the time the Chicago Sting soccer team. And so I was just fresh out of college. I was producing, uh, you know, first I was an intern and then I was associate producer and then I was a producer. And it was a great uh, teaching ground because, you know, you're kind of responsible for three hours of live television a night now sometimes there's a Sox game or a bulls game or something so you, we'd fill in the gaps and i met joel there um and then i went on to uh produce sports and news for abc in chicago for i don't know how many years um and then i left there just because i didn't see that as a career path uh, although lots of people are you know lots of people i worked with way back are still there uh and they, you know there's a lot of news lifers and whatever uh, but i enjoyed sports and so i did that and then i think i had a production company of my own and then i joined with joel and uh, we started uh semaphore media and i kind of came up with the idea of check please he was doing really more corporate stuff mm -hmm. and he helped on check please and i helped on the corporate stuff and then check please kind of got bigger and bigger so i uh, basically devoted all my time to that so before that idea for check please came out um you guys were kind of doing a day-to-day -day workflow with this company um and you're saying that he was doing some corporate stuff what was was that just kind of like you know um like gig work or or were you guys looking to develop a tv show what was your your vision at the time you know and i was just thinking about it because i, I missed a huge gap i also was in this company called orbis broadcast group where i was a partner and then we sold that i forgot okay. about that part and we did a lot of we had like seven eight camera crews big studio wow. so we produced a lot of television and then uh yeah so i think i wanted to do tv shows i'm not sure he, he did or not yeah, but um, you know, I'd done some, and I, I, you know, I produced a lot of TV. So some of it was short, some of it was half hour, some of it was, you know, healthcare related, sports, whatever. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do as far as a TV show, but I, that's what I did want to do. Right. Gotcha. And then so you were um, basically your process was just testing out different ideas for what a show could be at this time then, and kind of check please kind of was birthed out of that no i had an idea in a shower it was a good idea <laughs> all the best <laughs> ideas <laughs> it's like the entire show including the name uh it was basically the same show that it is today yeah and it's in 
bunch of other cities, same show. Uh, I basically pitched to PBS locally in Chicago because I thought that was a good spot for it because it's kind of it's got a certain um, purity and um, I didn't feel the show was going to be bastardized or diluted. Um, you know, I pitched them uh, that there should be a show on restaurants. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing. So, oh. and was there? Was there? There wasn't much on TV about restaurants at the time, right? Or 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 has was there? <laughs> was there a restaurant show already on the on? I think Food Network was going and all that, but there wasn't something that really explored cities' restaurants. Greg, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, yeah, I was just going to ask: Were you previously involved in restaurants and in the hospitality industry prior to Check Please, or this was just? Your introduction. I was a, I was a food enthusiast explorer from a very young age, but that's about it. Never worked in a restaurant, never served, never worked in the kitchen. And in some ways, I'm. I think it was better for the show because uh, you know the show is really about real people recommending their, their restaurants, and so I didn't get caught up in you know I got I I was I was viewing the restaurant as a, as a fan, right. I'm pretty good at like uh, understanding what a genuine restaurant is. I was pretty good at still am going into places and say this place is not going to be here two years from now, or this place is going to be you know a hit. Not always right. Nobody is, but I have a pretty good sense for that. And I have huge passion for food, and I have no problem exploring. To me. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a hole in the wall Thai place or the fanciest place in town. I I am equally passionate about them both. And if I go to, and I'm very big into diverse and juxtapositions. So uh, you know, if I'm in, I was just in San Francisco. We have a show there, and so I'll I'll like curate my eating schedule, but I'll make sure it's like up down Chinese, and then something on the wharf that's a little more big and touristy, and then a little Vietnamese place, and then like a fancy hot place, you know. So that's kind of that's kind of how I'm built. I just I, I kind of soak in everything. I like everything as long as it's good, and uh, I'm much more food oriented than like social. Although I like a social, I like fun. But there, I think more and more these days, people are going out to restaurants for the kind of the experience. So it's social plays a much, much bigger role. And so, yeah, so that's how it came about. Gotcha. And I did look it up. Uh, food Network started in 93. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they didn't come up with the actual Food Network name until 97. Okay. The, the network the network name. Just, just I like it. Reference. I like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but Food Network was never really a guide to restaurants. Mm hmm no, it was, it's probably been cooking shows the entire time, teaching people how to cook. And sure, um, you know, I mean, now they do a little bit on the restaurants with uh, with Guy Fieri and diners, yeah. drivers, and dives, and everything. Good show, right? Good show. Yeah, but yeah, if you look at if you look at diners, drivers, and dives, which I think it's it's actually constructed. It's not it's not the same as Check Place, but Check Place is always just three different restaurants with three people. And I think that show does. I think that show, it, they're all kind of diner-ish, but he'll do one in Cincinnati and one in Nashville and one in Hawaii, you know? And so you're getting different people, different types of things. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think he's great. The show's really well-produced. I think sometimes they run out of quality places. And so he has to kind of be a little overly enthusiastic about something he's probably not that enthusiastic about, but hey. You know, people people sense uh, whether something's genuine or not. So I always start to put together a genuine show. I think his enthusiasm is real, you know, so that's great. I was going to say one one of the great things about your show compared to like what Guy's doing on, on Food Network is if somebody doesn't like it, you can say that you don't like it. Like, and that's yeah. okay. He can't go on the show and be like, oh, this, this sucks. Yeah, what he does... And I don't watch that much. I actually don't watch that much food TV. <laughs> Just you know, and doing stuff like he'll take a bite, and if he loves it, it's like, oh, oh my god, it's so good. You know, I love how it really does. This is one of the best, you know, ham sandwiches I've ever had. But if he doesn't, he'll go. I could, I could taste the crunch. I can taste the crunch. There's a crunch in there. I'm like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's so the same. You're, I agree with what you're saying. He's kind of like, yes, he, he, because, because his show theoretically 
is I'm telling you the best diners, drives in, right? right? Okay. Our show is this person or these three people are telling you their favorite restaurants and they're telling you why that you should go there. And you may relate to the lawyer or you may relate to the truck driver or you may relate to the interior decorator or you may relate to all three, right? Mm -hmm. But you're getting a pretty you're pre getting a pretty fair read on the restaurant because we have all three basically re review each one of the restaurants and all three, whatever they are, for people who've never seen the show, they change every week. Um, all three people are are completely different from one another, and they're not three people that you would typically ever see sitting at a table together. So you get a you get a really a fair perspective on a place. So I was gonna. That's a kind of an area that I was gonna go to. I think that the show is successful because you cycle through people, um, you cycle through perspectives. Um, I'm not sure if the same show would be. Uh, successful if you had the same three people for a season or even if you just had you know the host that you've got um, giving her own recommendations well the show wouldn't be successful because the reason I created it with regular people was first and foremost because if the three of us were hosting the show by show three we're treated completely different than every other customer and I understand that so and I understood that going in so right, that's... and you run out of ideas. You you have to force yourself to be genuine. Like you're you're gonna yeah, be running the, into the, a lot. The first, I totally agree with what you're saying. The first and foremost thing that you can't get past is you're not getting a legitimate review. Because I I was asked quite frequently to have celebrity versions, mm -hmm. and I'm like I could do it for ratings or whatever, which I was never really interested in what the ratings were, but it's contrary to what the show is. Yeah, your highest your highest celebrity was a state legislator at the time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, he was, he, was guess, good, good guess. he was a good guest. Yeah, but... um, so for the original pitch about the show, I want to kind of bring us back to that that time. I had seen an interview that you did about eight months ago or so, um, where you spoke about how it wasn't originally just about restaurants; it was a little broader. Um, do you remember those sentiments or no? Yeah, okay. I... Either either I made something up or you're misreading it. Um, I think I might have said that people perceive the show as really about exploring and loving their city. Okay. So the byproduct of the show is because we take people all over town and we introduce you to people that are from these areas of Chicago or San Francisco, when it's a show in San Francisco, it's a show in Miami, there's one in Philly, I just got back from Phoenix, uh, there's been shows in other cities as well. You see your city um, through these people and through these places to the point where I had, you know, numerous people come up to me when they would, you know, meet me and what do you do? I tell them, and they'd go, oh my God, every single person that moves to Chicago, that's a friend of mine. I say, the first thing you do is you watch Check, Please, because it will give you a, the best view of what's what Chicago is. And so that's so that may have been what I was saying, or I just could have been you know, making <laughs> something it, just for the hell of it. What I had pulled, it might have been that, because you were talking about the process of developing the show a little bit. Um, so when that when that show took off, once it once you landed on that idea and it took off, um, how do you kind of stay inside of that workflow? Because it seems like you went from live TV, which is different every time, to a more cookie cutter environment. Is that, would you find that accurate or? No, but I went, there was a big gap between live TV and this, mm -hmm. and I did a lot of stuff. Um, some good, some not so good. And, you know, the bottom line and the reason I, this is taped live. Right. So we tape more than we air. So it gives us the flexibility of editing and it's not going out live. Right. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. I get the live energy, but I get to uh, play with it after the fact. So, uh, so, oh yeah, when, during taping, I mean, it's, you know, the same kind of like, you know, adrenaline rushing. You got regular people that are not used to being on television. But you got to deal with that. You got to make sure they're comfortable. Somebody's going to freeze. You got to make sure you, you know, I'm, the the guest selection process is as much about you know who you are, you know what restaurant you have. But I had forty thousand 
people sign up to be guests on Checklist. I have plenty of people to choose from. But you know, if I if I was pre-interviewing a potential guest, or staff was, and somebody told me, I you know, we'd say, why would you be a good guest? You know, four out of five. Oh, because I really love food, which in reality doesn't make you a good guest. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. It makes you somebody who loves food. But if somebody said, oh, I had a radio show in college. Oh, I'm a litigator. I, you know, I do trials. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're my, you're my person. You know, because I know that, all right, it gives me a much stronger likelihood that person is not going to freeze up. I always had like a 20% dilution factor for guests. No matter, generally, you're taking yourself down 20%. You're, all of a sudden, you're sitting here, you're worrying about, you know, the microphone, don't touch this, so I'm going to sit straight, what should I say? And then you have the added, you know, the added factor of, oh, I, I should I worry about what I'm going to say? Will I sound silly? So you have all these things. We did serve wine on the set, so you, so this third segment was always better than the first. But, um, <laughs> so sometimes you retake the first afterwards. But yeah, you know, people had a good time. We made it kind of like a, a really joyful experience. And my uh, instructions to guests, remember, they're recommending their restaurant. So their restaurant, each restaurant's going to come recommend. And so my instructions were have a good time, be honest, right? So that's about it. And, and I was talking to somebody today, uh, and we were to, I was on a panel talking about something. And I said, look, I, you know, I don't know. 20 years worth of shows. I never had a guest say that they, that we misrepresented them because we never did. And I never had a restaurant say uh, they were treated unfairly because we didn't treat them unfairly to the point where if, if you, if the three of us were guests and my restaurant was a dinner restaurant, but that I also did brunch on Sundays and you two just happened to only go to the brunch on Sunday, I'd be like, no, 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 that's not fair to the restaurant. You know, and I'd go, you have to, Tom, you have to go back. You have to go back. You're going for dinner. Just go back. You know, I don't care. Just go back on a Wednesday. Because because if for some reason we did that show and I was talking about how great everything was for dinner and you guys both went for brunch and you didn't like it, I'm a jerk as a producer. I'm a jerk. I didn't treat I didn't treat that restaurant fairly. It's not a brunch restaurant, it's a dinner restaurant. So yeah, I think that in restaurants, um, I was thinking about what makes them so special for TV because they are great for TV. Restaurants are phenomenal for TV. Um, you know, they're they're like a condensed dramatic experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got an artistic medium, which is the food, which is extremely variable. Um, and you've got the reactions that the people have to this this food and this experience. Um, it's tougher. Like our our podcast, our show is about hotels, right? And it's tougher to condense that experience like a restaurant can condense that experience. Yeah, but, you know, I'll say this. Uh, when I had the idea and I was pitching it, the TV part of the pitch was really, you know, I, I, I said, look, every restaurant's got to, like, it's theatrical, right? So all these restaurateurs are making decisions on what their place looks like, feels like, you know, um, Smells flows like. like, yeah. Hotels have a similar thing. We you know, most cells have a, have a, you know, what's the lobby like, you know, you know what, and if you stay, you know, you know I'm a Bonvoy, my, my wife's a Hyatt, so we have the <laughs> dueling, dueling allegiances, but I was just at a, what was I, in a Westin in, uh, in Phoenix, downtown Phoenix, uh, and, you know, it's a fairly basic hotel, but it, it, it's not trying to pretend it's something else. Right, it's a basic hotel with a small lobby, with a bar around the corner, an okay restaurant, and that's what it is. So, it, like it, you know, the room's decent size, and the shower was good, and you move on. You know. So then, was it about the restaurants, or was it about the people? It's about exploring. That's all it is. It's about you should you should explore, you know, your city. People want to know where to go. They, you know, what we, I think we're able to accomplish is trust. Kind of for some of the reasons I outlined before. Uh, We're genuine, right? You are eavesdropping on a conversation. Hmm. You're just eavesdropping on a conversation. So if you're changing the channel and you saw some tattooed guy sitting next to a grandma 
there's part of you that kind of goes, whoa, what, what's going on here? You know, oh, I want to see what, oh, I want to see if she likes his place. Oh, I want to see what he picked, you know? So there was a, and there's the tension of, oh, you know, after you see it, it's like, oh, he liked her place. Oh, I'm going to wonder if she'll like his place, you know? So there's all that stuff right. that, that, and so I could make it super basic or I could give you like 50 psychological layers deep, you know? <laughs> Right. So there's some people like to see people argue. Okay. Some people just watch the show as voyeurs in the sense that they're seeing the city. They're not going to any of these places. And then I have stories about, you know, people who uh, bumped into a woman. She's like, oh, I work for a, you know, kind of like a impoverished senior home. She said, and she's a volunteer. She says, I watch the show every week. I rent a van and the, the, least expensive of the restaurants i bring 12 seniors every week i'm like oh well that's good you know I mean? yeah but i have stories like that all i we had a babysitter we have four kids so and i'm walking the babysitter to the door this is like year three i don't even remember and i think i had a couple cocktails and i'm my deal with my wife is just please don't make me drive the baby just find a babysitter we don't have to drive home you know just that's all that's all i care about so she's leaving and I'm paying her or whatever and she goes, can I tell you something? I'm like, sure. She goes, because I, I also must have had stuff around there. She goes, um, like, like, like somebody's looking in. She goes, I'm in a check, please club. I'm like, you're in what? She goes, I'm in a, I'm in a check, please club. I'm like, well, what's a check, please club? And she, this was the part tells you I'm not very good at business. She goes, oh, there's lots of check, please clubs. And I'm like, <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm like, really? And I'm like, well, what's your check, please club? And she's like, well, our check, please club is we, I was like, my 10 girlfriends and I, they don't get together. They watch it at home and then they vote on which of the three restaurants they're going to go to. And then they go, you know, so you had all these very communal and it's because they're finding out new places and they're going to neighborhoods. You, what, what we've been, we, we were able to do. And I think the Chicago show showed, you know, I think probably did it best because it's really more of an extension of me. And that's just who I am. We were able to, articulate expectations for the viewer. So people would sit and watch the show and uh, Gladys would say to Herb, you know, oh, let's go there. They wouldn't know what neighborhood it was. In. They'd never been to that neighborhood, but they knew what to wear. They knew what to order. They knew what the place looked like. They knew what the chef looked like, right? So we gave them an instant comfort level to get past their comfort zone, which is usually geographic, or it could be, you know, it could be the type of food, right? So, so now they're seeing the food and they're seeing this, you know, they're seeing this cafeteria worker or public relations exec or somebody they relate to like the Malaysian food that they've never had. And so we're going to go to that Malaysian restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna try it out. And I know what to. Oh, I. But no, let's get what she had. She said it wasn't spicy. Whatever. So you've you've articulated enough for them to just. I, I would talk to restaurateurs. I never, I never studied. You know, effects. There was a whole check please effect thing. But it was kind of like it was kind of like they would tell me <laughs> they'd say two things, which I was like, they'd go, oh, we're getting people from zip codes we've never gotten before because they could see it on the the. Um, mm -hmm credit cards and and then they'd also say not everybody but because it's like all anecdotal they'd go you know what you have like the nicest audience and i would kind of say to myself well they're probably not nicer than any other restaurant goer but they've are they're excited to be there and they already kind of know what to expect mm -hmm. Right. So it makes them it makes them like maybe a better diner for the restaurant. Right. And out of all of the all of the audience members that you do have, they're more likely to be high in openness to where they'd be willing to go out and try a place that they saw on TV where some people might be more reserved. They wouldn't go out and see it or try it. I can't I can't speak to that. I can just tell you that if you if you're a trusted source, I, if I go out, the first question, you know, somebody they don't you know, what do you do? Eh. Oh, what's your favorite restaurant? Or where should I go? Mm -hmm. You know, where should I go? So, so I want to make you a promise. Um, to, today, and I've seen a couple of, I've seen you speak a couple of times. Um, there was a meeting we went to, you spoke at, and then I saw a couple of interviews of, of, uh, of yours. 
and you get asked all the time, um, what are your favorite restaurants and where should we eat? True. I promise not to ask you either of those questions. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I, 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 it's my joy to answer, but I, but here's what I would do. I would, I would, go back to you and say you got to give me a couple you like first so i can understand well that's like before and that's and that's that's your standard response and i will okay. i won't ask you okay it's fair enough if you won't answer it. well it, yeah well yeah man what you like what you're going out to right. eat for and all those it's, things yeah but, of course it's right. too dependent yeah. you get it too much but what that means is <laughs> oh wait wait just before i interrupt my next venture is entirely that so clearly it doesn't bother me that I get it too much because I'm actually going to create a new project based on that. Well, it's so probably because there's so much interest that you're finding from it that you're deciding that you've got. I it. kind of felt, I don't want to get into like, you know, people's brands, right? Yeah. But my brand is kind of Pandora-esque, right? Right. Tell me what you like. I'll I'll give you some suggestions of places I think you you like. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like a curator's brand where uh, you know AI can do that. You have it on you know, Amazon started Amazon. it, Netflix. You know you you name it. It's 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 not it's not a new concept, but from a kind of like human concept where and like like you're saying, it's like in some ways, what do you want to accomplish? You're going out for your anniversary. Are you going out with your grandparents, which is different than going out with your buddies. Right, just as so. Yeah, and also, how could you? How could you know? You know, a, an individual. Sometimes they're. Oh, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, right. Um, and then, how could you feel about you know if they do have a bad experience with you know some waiter that woke up on the wrong side of the? Oh room? no, I you know it's like yeah you know I will say one thing when I first um, had the show before it was on I think we'd done the pilot but maybe we we're in production <laughs> I was somewhere and I asked this nice very nice you know thirty year old woman. And I said, oh, tell me your three favorite restaurants. And she did. And I said, oh, I still remember this. This is 2001, okay? And she told me, and I said, oh, so you live like, um, you live like on Broadway near like Belmont. And she goes, am I that predictable? And I, so I said, I'm never going to do that again. Because I could tell from her restaurants, that's her comfort zone. I know those restaurants. So I'm pretty much saying I know where you live, right? Just based on that. So in some ways, the show took people past that yeah right? just allowed them to expand past that so i never did that again and i said oh so you live at <laughs> she was like she was like deflated she was like, she was like oh am i that predictable that's great <laughs> i was like all right sorry sorry but clearly you do live there yeah clearly <laughs> clearly, like, well, clearly. um uh, no because i was gonna say like if you ever felt like hesitation um from becoming the the check please guy the check please persona um people know you by that brand and and because of that they associate you heavily with restaurants mm -hmm. um and you've probably seen your public identity shift from the production guy that was doing you know live tv and sports and different shows to the restaurant guy um mm -hmm. which Fair is enough. a world that you didn't grow up in didn't train in didn't learn from um so has there ever been like a, a hesitation to that identity shift and like how do you how has that made you feel over the years is there any sort of imposter syndrome that comes from that I feel like breaking down <laughs> i'm a fraud no I, is that, is that like, <laughs> you're making me question my entire existence no, I, uh, I get a, I get a because I, no, there's no imposter syndrome if you're saying imposter syndrome in the sense that how can he say i have never ever nor would i try to say that i'm some kind of food expert i work with alpina singh alpina singh is a master sommelier she is a she is a savant as far as what she can do with taste and smell. She's an expert. Okay, she's a. I've been lucky enough to be around a lot of super accomplished people in the food and, and drink world. Am I an expert? No. In some ways, I'm 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 regular guy plus, right? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. I'm I'm I I. I, I have a certain, I have a pretty good, um, visually, I'm pretty, you know, I, I can, I can tell a story pretty well, you know, uh, and maybe that's partly why I went into television. Cause I just have that affinity, but, uh, no, no, I, 
my attitude always was, look, you, I created a show I'd want to watch. I tell restaurant, I can walk into a restaurant and you want to talk about imposter syndrome. I could tell th this, this restaurant doesn't know what, what, what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. No question about it. I can, I can, because it didn't create the restaurant that they'd want to go to. It created a restaurant that they thought they had an audience for. Right. And sometimes those work and sometimes, and sometimes, you know, big, you're, if you're big and you're a chain, you know, that's what they do. They work on, you know, traffic and margins. But, um, yeah, so I can, I can, you know, there's a few things on, uh, uh, that I, that I just kind of, I, I, you know, I totally trust my gut too. Right. So I'm not going to tell you that if you like a restaurant that I think it's not that good, that you're wrong. I'm not going to tell you. I would believe you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just I'll thank you. Yeah. I'll thank you for sure. It's not like me but... <laughs> movies, man. If if somebody tells me a movie, I'll be like, okay, right. You you watch that movie, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but but you know what? But I can also I think because you know look one I had a huge amount of data coming in, right? Lots of data, and and I trust my gut, and I kind of I know who. Generally, the good guys, good people are versus the bad. Um, and there's much more good than bad. Uh, and I can tell you who the good operators are for the most part. And, the, and you know what? I can tell you a confident restaurant when I get there. I can walk in and say, this is a confident restaurant. It's a confident chef, whatever. So half of it is just kind of believing in yourself. And no, there was no, look, my check plays life because it was it was kind of like had such a warm relationship with um the audience uh and people really really you know like they they it's part of their it's it's part of their excuse me fabric you know it was a, it was part of the city right it's like it was a it was a thing you know so that persona on and yet still i was not the face of the show right so i could you know walk into a little hole in the wall in Pilsen. No, I don't know where I am. I don't, you know, I don't go right. in, you know, kind of like have, need to, you know, say something in advance. I, you know, I would have people like, you know, lay down rose petals as I was walking, but that's just completely, <laughs> that's a completely different story. So, yeah. So, I, you know, so anyway, but yes, to answer your question, I think I answered your question. Eh, you know, I have I a think, good time. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think you got it. Cause I mean, part of the reason why I asked was because I kind of come from a similar, um, is kind of a similar carve where I started in film school and then ended up working in hotels and now I make a show about hotels. Mm -hmm. And um, it feels weird because I never really had a passion for hotels. Mm. Um, so I've learned about hotels since then and I kind of have, have learned to speak the lingo, um, but it's hard for me to to fully kind of uh embrace myself in that world and i feel embraced and it's hard for me to embrace it back yeah but i but i did have a passion for food and restaurants yeah. as a matter of fact the podcast that we're doing uh probably good. well it's what, when are we march 8th 9th 10th something like that so it's getting released right now is with a guy named scott harris he has he has 26 or so restaurants um but his first restaurant was Mia Francesca. Mia Francesca was my defining falling in love with dining as a 20 something year old restaurant. Uh, what, what, what was that about? Why did you? Because Mia Francesca is on, is basically in Lakeview and no reservations. You'd have to get there early. There'd be a line. It's Italian food with paper menus and it was just great energy. And you just felt great about being there. And you felt like, it was a special night out, even if you were 25 and it didn't cost much money. It was just great. Just wow. great. I couldn't, I went there, you know, lots and lots of times. And each time, you know, you're there on a date or you're there with your boys, or you're there with whatever. And it was just great. It are, made me are they still around? love. Yeah, Francesca is there. And now he has like 11 Francescas. Yeah, Francesca's yeah it's still over on Clark. See, look at it. We didn't ask for a recommendation, but we still got we one. We got it anyway. Well, yes. We got and, but I haven't been me a friend. I mean, I have them once in a while. But I, yeah. as 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 a young person, yeah. you know, I was there all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, cool. So um, I do have a question because right now you're doing a, a podcast as well, and that's for Crane Chicago Business, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to 
kind of touch on how that's been different for you from working with TV and working TV stations. And also maybe like the different environment that you're seeing today. Because right now, media is very, very saturated. Anybody can pick up a camera, as you can see. Just, you know, Greg and I are just some couple of couple of dudes that picked up some cameras and bought some microphones and boom we've got a show there you go um not something that you could have really done um back when check please started so right. what does that how does that change the environment that we're working in and what is what's your experience? you're asking such smart questions of depth and i think you're expecting you know equivalently smart depth filled <laughs> answers no you're fine man <laughs> the versus, versus like hey you know they're you know i'm having a good time i'm running around eating i'm telling people where to go or at least suggesting it i'm talking to great people you know I, look i talked to scott harris who i just mentioned next week i'm doing something on food storytelling the week after i've got you know a show from the he's the he runs eater in chicago we're talking about you know, interesting stuff because I've known him for a while. After that, I've got another chef. Oh, I've got Amy Morton, whose you know father Arnie Morton started Arnie's, and then he created Morton the Steakhouse, which is you know. So, so you know, I'm still it, it, the. There's not much difference in my attitude in the sense that I'm exploring. Inter I've probably interviewed a thousand chefs, right? Because I, you know, every show we had a chef or an owner interview. Um, you know, so this is the same. It's now the only difference is um, it's more than just, you know, my family that gets me to hear stories and stuff. So, nice. yeah. yeah, my family doesn't even listen to our stories here. <laughs> oh, no, my family doesn't. No, I, 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 I didn't say they're listening to my stories. I just <laughs> think like they're in the room. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, you're, you're doing that thing again. All right. Yeah. No, no, I'm just talking about, no, it's like, you know, a lot of the stuff. I mean, I've, the, you know, when, when you've been around a lot uh, uh, long enough and, and you're open and you know i'm totally curious yeah. so i'm having conversations with the bus boy and like the sous chef and the owner and the bartender and it's like i'm kind of like i'm kind of just like i, I want to absorb what's going on and uh you know so i have a lot of i have a lot of great um experiences and sometimes i talk about them See, that's 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 the premise for a great show is just a curious conversation. I think that's why that's what makes podcasting special. You know, ah, that's, the, that's the medium right there. Yeah, I don't know what the secret sauce is in podcasting, but I do think that's, that's the secret sauce. I think. Yeah, I try to keep things, you know, look. For instance, for my for my podcast, part of it is like, how do you make it interesting every week? So I have to calculate that in. You can't just think about the one show. I have to kind of think about like, what format am I going to do? So I was talking to um, um, a chef yesterday and we were talking, I interviewed him, it was great. he's a great guy. And uh, we were talking afterwards and I said, look, I, you know, I'm not asking every chef, tell me why, what made you decide to become a chef. It becomes like wallpaper, right? Mm -hmm. It's fine. They don't. They don't even want to answer. I'm not that interested in it, right? Okay. Unless it's a real story, like something. There's some epiphany somewhere. And he was like, I have to "Thank God." He said, "Thank God," because that's the typical question he gets, right? And so I'm, you know, it's like, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a little bit of who they are, what their opinions are, you know, you know, what the trends are to a point, what makes a good restaurant what makes his place special or not her place special or not you know i can i can see somebody when they're talking about something and i can tell when they're super enthusiastic about something and so i can build on that right, right. so um so i guess i'm kind of you could ask me a really intellectual yeah, depth question. Question. <laughs> Let me have another. Let me have another sip of my bourbon or rye or whatever. I'm I want to maybe take a, a gulp or two. Uh, <laughs> no, I. Um, that's how I kind of feel about when we have guests on the show, and I've tried to kind of do it with you as, here as well as like, especially if that person has done a lot of interviews in the past or it works oftentimes with people that know who they are. Mm -hmm. I try to ask the questions that you're that they haven't gotten before. Yeah, before. fair enough. If it is a question that they've gotten before, I'm going to try to put a spin on it. 
I know that you've done a lot of production in the past, um, and this is one of the extras that I kind of threw your way in our um, in our emails. Um, how do you grow past a show? Because it, it it sounds like it's tough to evolve afterwards. Well, yes and no. I mean, I guess um, the show in Chicago stopped. I have the other shows in the other cities, and I'm kind of doing what are we two point oh or three point oh. And it's exciting. So the evolution for me is in some ways, I'm the, um, I was never the talent, however you want to describe it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And now, and so I was never really giving my opinions or anything like that. And now I am. So there is a complete, there's a, I was talking to a PR friend of mine uh, in Miami and she's like, that's so exciting. Like, I'm so excited for you. And she's known me for 20 years, you know, because you, you just, you know, so, and you challenge yourself a little bit. And, you know, so I don't, I, I look at that as an evolution. Did you and, ever feel unchallenged by Check, Please, where you wanted to to kind of figure out what the next step was for yourself? It was more, I'm not trying to avoid your question. It was more important to me that the show remained really high quality with high standards. So if I felt that the show was dwindling that would bother me. I didn't really want to go. I didn't want the. Sh- I didn't want anyone to ever say, "Oh yeah, it used to be so good. What happened?" Mm-hmm. Right. That's to me is like uh, it's deflating. So I did, hope did that you, answered. Did Did you see stuff like that happening, or did what? What no. look like? To you? No. I didn't see that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had some bumps in the road. Yeah. You know, and I any show does. Yeah. yeah, and I would try to repair those bumps. You know. Right. And sometimes you have to make some tough decisions to to repair that. But if your decisions are really always, I just want the show to be great, you know, yeah. then then hopefully that that hopefully everybody wins from that. Well, the the feeling of wanting a show to be great, um, it, it's it's so key in live production to have like quick decision making skills. Yeah. Um, and kind of knowing what's going to be good for TV, knowing what's going to be, you know dramatic or or interesting or intriguing um i've been on enough sets to know that stuff goes wrong on sets it's Mm -hmm. like they're they're like stuff going wrong magnets every time time i feel with tom something's going wrong Mm. it's it's not just me brother i promise you (laughs) we do some live production sometimes we'll have you know guests on whether they'll be hosts for us or we'll do other things right um, you know, you're either going to forget your media card or somebody's not going to show up or it's going to be some massive thing. Right, right, right. You know, what's your philosophy on, on solving problems on the fly? How, well, first, what, do you have a great production story, a huge crisis, anything from your past that it's like a crazy kind of a worst production nightmare kind of a thing? Make, make Tom feel better about our production Yeah, make me feel better about some of my worst production nightmares. Uh, first of all, let me ask, answer the broad strokes part yeah. you know producing is is experience coupled with common sense and it's also knowing the difference between big problems and little problems most of them are little problems okay mm-hmm. so if you kind of go into it and saying like this is if you freak out over every problem then you're gonna you're gonna have a stressful life so most of my little problems you know no lights in a set that needs lights yeah that's a pretty big problem yeah i mean yeah i haven't experienced that yet um but but you know also you know crisis opportunity there's a great line by i don't remember a sydney pollock or sydney lumet the director they're both directors one of them said if you had an unlimited budget in making films, every film would suck because you're not forced to come up with creative solutions to every, to anything. You just keep on doing it. So it's just, you know, just throw money at it. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't think I have any, any real crazy crisis. You know, I remember, I do remember this. I was getting married and I'm talking about getting married not like about to get married. Uh, the ultimate crisis. Vows getting <laughs> married. 
It was, I think our wedding was at six o'clock. It was an incredibly windy Chicago day. So for those who don't live in Chicago, you're like, of course, every day is windy in Chicago, which is really not. <laughs> right. But it was an incredibly windy day. And I'm doing my vows and the power goes off. And I can tell the power goes off. Okay. And I'm sitting there while I'm doing my vows as a kind of producer going like, no little problems, it's kind of big problem because it's going to be dark in like an hour, you know, <laughs> and we're going to have no power. And I'm literally thinking that in my head as I'm going. Um, and so it was, it was uh, no electricity for, you know, 45 minutes and there's candles and we had the, we had like a little three piece band or something that was violinists and whatever and they were great so it was very romantic and then the power came back on and it was fabulous yeah. so it was just like a now sure you know we would have figured it out but it would have been tough right so that so if you can get past that get past anything greg and i used to work at a hotel together and i never i never called him like he was my boss right, right. and i was his his pm manager so i would cover um, the hotel while while he was away mm. and i never called him For, like truly really never called right. him i tried to figure out as much as i could at that's great right. um but there was this one time right. where I, I, I did call him and it was because the entire hotel lost power nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this one i don't have a solution for right yeah yeah i have a question for you guys though yeah. what's the difference articulate for me the difference between a hotel restaurant and like a, a, an owner operated restaurant. I feel like hotel restaurants are mainly built um, just because they have to be, because a lot of brands demand them. Okay. So they don't put a lot enough effort and care um, and confidence into them. Cause it's they, and a lot of them go they're like, Oh, they're going to be losses. Like we're just, it's just doing it because the brand says we have to have breakfast. We have to have for lunch and dinner. Sure. So that's, that's the main difference that I see. Um, where where they own and operate them themselves, they actually care and they're trying to make a living off of it. Yeah, but and and with hotels, what's the hierarchy? The restaurants are at the bottom. Um, yeah, because we your rooms are more profitable, easily more profitable. You're you're getting right. sixty seventy percent easily profit on your room rate. Sure. So in most restaurants then, but there are some hotels that, you know, do really well through restaurants are one of our co-hosts, Kyle, he's at the double tree in Reading, Pennsylvania, and their big focus is on their food and beverage. Interesting. Their, their restaurant kills it and they make a ton of money off of it. And their cat catering is where they make the most money. Sure. Right. Cause they can charge more, but their restaurant kills is right across the street from a, from a arena. They have a killer menu. So they really focus on it and do it right. Right. I, I sense what you're saying and i will tell you this if there was a if 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 there was 10 if i was going to pick your city and there was 10 hotels i was interested in staying at and one of them had a really really good restaurant where i knew i could just eat there one night because it's like a place i would go to if i was staying somewhere else i'd probably stay at that hotel so yeah. there's an opportunity you know for you know upgraded hotel restaurants to actually get you know overnight guests oh yeah definitely i mean i i just came back from los angeles with the family and i stayed at a hotel uh it was a hampton inn which doesn't have any restaurants but because i knew i was going to go out and eat like i, I wasn't planning on eating in a hotel but right. yeah if i'm going to stay somewhere long term i definitely would want to pick a hotel that has a nice restaurant that i yeah. can enjoy a nice meal at yeah, when sure. i stayed in when i stayed in waikiki beach that's the reason why i chose the hotel that i stayed at because i stayed at a hilton garden in there mm -hmm. um which usually doesn't have a crazy uh restaurant element but um, i noticed right away that their reviews were all mentioning this restaurant that they interesting had. Mm -hmm. and so i was like you know what out of all of the hilton products i'm a hilton guy out of all yeah. the hilton products that are you know in this area i'm gonna go with this because it's got got the F&B element. And Greg like and I have an experience with a hotel restaurant that had no identity whatsoever. <laughs> um, it Because they it was just purely a loss, there was no real leadership for the restaurant because the hotel had to operate, the restaurant sure. had to operate, the, the leadership for the restaurant turned over and they're just looking for people to fill the restaurant, but they're keeping the restaurant open at the same time. So you've got this ghost ship of a restaurant running with really 
out of date menu, no atmosphere, right. staff that's run to the ground. Truly, it was the worst restaurant that you could yeah. rest it, it, run. It would, you know? That's frightening. And but the the problem is that's going to happen with hotel restaurants because mm. they've got to keep it open, right. you know, and they can keep it open, right? You Especially know? these big branded restaurants. I mean, a lot of hotels now. Um, you know, I was at the Wit Hotel. They have their State and Lake restaurant, rooftop mm. bars. So those are profit centers for them. But right. then if you stay at you know a standard Hilton Chicago, for example, their restaurant has to be open, right? So if they don't make money off of it. Right. It's not the end of the world. They'll try to, but they they won't try to but, push. But them. a lot of the fancier ones started adding and promoting name chefs, right? Their right. restaurants became, which I always thought was fine until that chef leaves. Because then you either have to do it all over again, right? Right. Or you have to just kind of reconcept or something. And that happens all the time where they have, and they've got this person and isn't this great and they're avant-garde food or pick whatever. And then 18 months later, chef go bye-bye. Then where are you? Then they have to start all over again. Start all over or reconcept or change the name or whatever. So it's tough. That's why I don't know what my opinion is yet. I, I haven't really felt it out on um, whether it's better to have an outside restaurant group come in and manage that restaurant or if it's mm -hmm. better to manage it in-house with the management company that's doing the hotel. Right. Um, because if, you're, if your management company's entire resources are put towards just the restaurant, um, then they're going to make it as good as they can make it. And there might be some integration problems between the restaurant and the hotel, but those can sort themselves out. Um, whereas if it's one management company managing both, they're going to prioritize the hotel. They're not right. going to prioritize the restaurant. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. I was just interested in your opinion. Um, but, uh, so. Yeah. Well, um, Greg, I, I kind of ran through my, my questions. <laughs> so yeah, he tried his best. He tried his best to like beat me down. <laughs> He's like trying to beat me down. Like I thought it was a therapy experience. It was a podcast. I don't you know, know, you know, I've had enough therapy where I can actually upgrade people. So you know, I'm, it's like I'm, I'm easy. Give it your best shot. That's what yeah, I said. You've got the loyalty points where you can come in. And have a <laughs> exactly. It's like you started here, but I think I can. I think I can get you a higher floor. My my whole thing is like you know you. I am so um, you know I'm 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 lucky right i go out to a lot of places and and so to me i'm not i am not going out and while i'm there judging anything right i'm like am i having a good time is the food good do i remember it do i want to go back there are people that can tell you every ingredient in the dish they had right i'm just all going back and i just i just know it's really really good okay i could you know my wife's a super good cook right and so and so i when i eat at home i eat really really good so it makes me super happy. I get excited. I describe it like when I was a kid, I was like a grandmother's dream. I mean, like I'll eat everything. I'm excited by it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't eat crap, right? Yeah. You know, so if I so if I was at some place, if I was at your, you know, horrific rest, uh, hotel restaurant, I'm just not. I'm just. I'm not eating there. No, you would just not eat it. No, you would I'm not. Walk out. You would. I wouldn't even walk in. I literally, I, you I'd probably stand, wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. I did not be like. I'd be like, nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, 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 because it's because I, I don't want to make it sound like you know I'm, I'm above anybody. It's too important to me. I don't. And to other people, there's a lot of people that just give them fuel. You know, fuel is fuel is Wendy's, right? McDonald's is fuel. You know, Burger King, KFC. That's fuel. Right. And that and that's what they care about. Just because you can fill me up. I'm like, great. Or they'll judge a restaurant by how much food they were given. Right. That's that's fine. That's just who they are. It's just not who I am. So Yeah. Great. Well, David, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been so much fun. It's been a good one. So much fun. I'll have to I'll have to analyze uh, you know, my my <laughs> my inner being <laughs> for a little bit. But I, can't, um, I think I think I, I think I can handle it. We, yeah. you know, we like to throw a couple of curve, uh, curveballs every now and then. As I said, your questions were filled in, in intelligent and filled with depth, and so I'm like, you. you know, I'm not prepared for those. Well, <laughs> um, we'll we'll welcome you back to the show anytime, as as long as I can have some time to put together another list of questions. Um, and dive in deeper. 
That's dive right. Into dive, dive as next deep, is delve as deep. <laughs> if you can figure out what's going on up there in my head, I'm like, God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> All, All right. right. All right, guys. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Bye.